I threw a guitar on the floor and then went, oh, why did I do that? Hey everybody, I'm here in Austria, the place where I live now at Spamfest, and I've met Frank Turner. Hello. How are you, sir? Uh, I'm much better than I was before we met. <laughs> no, I'm good, thank you. Yeah. What a charmer. Thank you, I mate. Know. <laughs> um, it's, I know it's not your first time in Austria, you've been here no. several times, yes. but has it ever been so beautiful? I mean, once or twice, yes. I mean, but it's a very beautiful day and we're in a very beautiful place. And there's a very beautiful lineup on the stage today. So uh, the Menzigas are playing in the background. Uh, and I'm sad to be missing them, but we are about to do four more shows of them. So I will see them again. So it's OK. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a good day. It's a good day in my life. Good. We're going to talk about gear in this video. I'm really stoked. Which is great for you guys watching this if you're regular to the channel. But I wasn't expecting to talk to you about gear because I was expecting to talk about songs. So we, we can we, go there. We can do both. We can do anything. I, I, I spend more time talking about songs in interviews and less time talking about gear in general. And I like talking about gear because for obvious reasons. Yeah, because it's, it's shiny and new. and Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, totally. Well, I also I built my own recording studio in the last three years, so I will be here for fucking I, I hours. saw the video you did for Black Star, I believe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where you're in this little cool hut. Yeah, that's, that's, that's mine. That's my hut. My wife calls it the mega shed, which arguably it is. <laughs> it's the world's most expensive garden shed. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's my, and we're actually we're going to be tracking my next record there um, next month. Excellent. So I'm excited about that. Recently with the latest album, you've gone electric, as it were. Yeah, I mean, I've been playing an electric guitar live on and off for probably like six or seven years. Um, and there have been moments on records where I've played electric here and there. Bringing one into the live show, um, it wasn't quite the Judas moment that I was expecting. Do you know what I mean? But the most recent album I did was very, much, very consciously a punk rock record. Do you know what I mean? For which not every song, but for a lot of it, I played electric guitar. Um, and I, how best to say this? I mean, I'm kind of at a point in my career right now where I'm sort of slightly kind of a phase of kind of restatement might be the word. So I have like sort of post the pandemic, I'm in my 40s, I'm working on an album 10. I've got a new drummer in my band I, and I'm like, I'm in a, I'm on a real kind of punk rock trip right now. So not only is a new record in that vein, but we've kind of like toughened up some of the older material a little bit as well. And uh, yeah, I've been playing uh, my, my electrics live. Uh, I saw you playing record. an SG. Yeah, so the SG is my new toy, um, which I'm very, it's an SG Junior. So to explain, so my, my main electric I've been playing for ages is, uh, it's a, it is a um, uh, Les Paul, it's a hollow Les Paul, it's called an ES series, it's a prototype for a line that they never ended up manufacturing, I found out the other day. They gave it to me to try, because they wanted someone to try it, right? And yeah. it's it's a hollow hey, Les Paul. Can I get in there with Yo! you? Yo! Come on in! Hi! Hi. Hey, how um, is it in there? What's your favorite guitar? Uh, yours. There we go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, so they gave it to me to try, and it's a it's a Les Paul, um, but it's hollow. The ES Les and, Paul. Yeah, ES Les Paul, and it's it's light as anything. I have back problems, so I can't really play heavy guitars. Played it live, love it, um, and uh, interestingly, one of the things we've done is my guitar tech has unwired the selector switch and the neck pickup because I never use them, right. and I kept hitting the neck switch and like well you know you're playing away and then it either changes the pickup or just kills the guitar or whatever and so now there's no wires attached to the selector switch at all or indeed the neck pickup they've taken them both out nice. and in fact i'm going to put a p90 in it quite soon because so that's that guitar i did then i went to them and went can i get another one so i have a pair because you generally need a spare guitar alive in case something goes wrong and they were like there are no more that's the one and i was like Fuck. Um, anyway, then I got an SG Junior off them, which I fucking love because it's super light and it's got this roaring P90 in it. So what I'm trying to do is get the same pickup fitted in my original electric so that I, A, have similar kind of sound, but also it's just that pickup sounds fucking ridiculous. But yeah, the SG's great. You can, I love the fact that the little sort of, you know, the, the horn, the handle, you can just sort of wave it around and it's basically made out of paper weight wise. Um, I'm getting used to the heavy headstock thing, you know what I mean, with an SG? Yeah. I let go I of it and do this, though. and it goes whoop, and you're like, oh no. And the first show we did with it, I hadn't played it standing up yet. I played it sitting down, bought it, was like, this is fucking great, put the strap locks on it. First show, I was like, come on, motherfuckers, where's my guitar? So now I've got used to it, but uh, it's, uh, it's a classic SG problem. There's going to be a lot of people watching this who's going to say, buy a suede strap or put pennies in, yeah. the, in the cavity or and something. All the, yeah, or like, well, I've seen some people who will attach the strap to the headstock like you do on an acoustic kind of thing. 
But I just got, I'm used to it's it now. It's, it's very rock and roll, isn't well, it? Well, it's just really not that big an issue. Right. <laughs> People always ask me, because I'm an SG player as well, right. because I have monkey arms, and I like the fact that the first fret's all the way over there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And people always say, oh, neck dive. It, I mean, it's just not, 99% of the time I'm holding the guitar, I'm using both hands. Sure. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and like, it's just, it's not that big a problem. Are you, into, I, are you into you know. pedals at all? Uh, not, well, ish. Live, no, is the answer. Okay. Um, basically, live, I use a Kemper rig. Um, for a bunch of different reasons. So you've just upset a lot of people by saying that. Yeah, and I'm going to fucking Good. defend it. I'm going to defend it. To tell, the us. Best. tell us, tell us. Well, first of all, it's my my touring sound engineer, Connor Mullen, who is incidentally basically the best touring sound engineer in the fucking world, as far as I'm concerned. It was extremely keen to get me on a camper for a bunch of different reasons. We spent uh, like days working on the sound, you know, the sounds that I have. I've got my four. I actually use just the floor package now because it's more efficient. But it basically means, you know, I have one in the UK, I have one in the States, I've got a USP key that we take between with us to, between tours, so that if I make a tweak on a sound, then you just shove it in the other end, use it. But I don't generally use them in the studio um, often, but if you do want to, it's like, there's my live sound. It's incredibly convenient, and essentially, I know some people are like tone maniacs and all the rest of it, but if you want to get technical about this, in the sound chain, every single moment of transition is a potential problem, whether it's, you know, from strings to pick up, pick up to cable, cable to mic but then if you bring in as well you know a microphone speaker thing sure you might if you do it right you uh you might get a better tone but the problem is is like if what you're doing every single day is loading into a different venue with a spec that you don't know with and all the rest and then i basically play rhythm guitar in the middle of an extremely loud rock band the kemper does more than enough and is more reliable it's I mean, a bottom line, isn't it? Right? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's a practicality thing. Do you know what I mean? And like, I understand. And the other thing as well is that I feel like tone junkies, like Jason Isbell is a good friend of mine. He's a proper tone junkie and he knows what he's doing when it comes to tone junking. But the point is, not only does he have the knowledge and the skill, he also has the money to have like, he's got like a whatever it is, a 52 Les Paul. And, right. and, and like, you know, and so yeah, yeah, he doesn't use a Kemper. But it's like, I'm not Jason Isbell and I'm not about to be Jason Isbell anytime soon. I play rhythm guitar in a punk rock band. Kemper absolutely more than brilliant for my purposes. Good. Well, there is also a JCM 900 on stage that everyone's using and everyone's I do like it. That. I like a JCM 900. So in the, when it comes, so more in the studio, I have more opinions about amps. Sure. I'm a big orange amp fan, Ben, my guitarist. So this is the thing, Ben, my guitarist doesn't use Kemper, the electric player in my band, but he uses an orange rig. Although he's running through one of the mini Terra, like sort of, you know, before it goes into his oh, really? speaker kind of thing. So he's kind of got, as it were, DI and Mike okay, on cool. his electric sound, which is cool. He's also a pedal guy. I think he has a lot of Zevvex stuff. Um, also, uh, like my bass player, he's a bass butler, the orange bass butler, which is the only thing anyone ever needs to play bass through ever again, um, in my humble opinion. I've got a Sans Amp RBI in my studio, which is amazing, but the bass nice. butler is as good, which is saying something, because the Sans Amp is... Anyway, um, but I mean, I have a pedal collection at home for my studio, but I mean, that's... It's more a case of, because my studio is more for me to record other bands. The fact I'm recording my own record there is uh, is a new development. Um, I've been producing other bands. So I have kind of a toolbox, if you like. So, you know, I've got a Tube Screamer and I've got a Rat and I've got a Russian Big Muff. And, you know, you have some toys in case the band coming in don't have the right uh, pedal for the right sound. Is that like... Do you think about you might be doing that in the future? Like all this touring is oh, yeah, obviously yeah. hard work. And well, then... so I started learning how to do this basically properly during lockdown. First lockdown kicked in, it was like, I need a hobby or else I'm going to go insane. And it was like, I'm either going to learn to play the piano properly or learn how to mix records and mic stuff up. And I still can't play the piano. But uh, so I like recently I did records for Pet Needs and for The Mess, for The Wills of Boys, for Guys. Um, I've been doing producing for other people and it's great. I love it. It's really fun. Oh, wait. Well, it's really exciting talking to you about gear, and uh, yeah, I mean, well, we could we can get hard. Harder I can feel into that this. we could go into it. What, yeah, what, yeah. what would you be playing on stage if if you could really if you had the practicality of the Kemper? What would your dream setup be? In, ter in terms of if the Kemper of didn't exist, yeah, if the Kemper the whole, didn't the exist. Thing. I'd probably have an orange rig. I reckon. Um, uh, I, one of the things I like about I'm I, I'm I grew up listening to Fugazi, and Fugazi are the, the the only punk band that matter. Um, uh, but they are also like. The whole thing was they had no pedals. It was they had Marshall, like they had the old M100 heads, mm -hmm. and they've got like um, guitars, and they just used the volume controllers that, instead of a distortion pedal. And it was like, how fucking cool is that? And I know a lot of people, particularly when they're younger, they get kind of like pedal or indeed gear crazy. We all do, right? You go through a period of your life where you're like, I need a multi effects unit that has 9,000 sounds. It's like, you don't. 
way better. Um, and for Ghazi, it was really inspiring to me as a kid. And now I'm hurting you, I'm sorry. But as a kid, you know what I mean? I did I, it too. I, I don't disagree. I, I, just, I did it, it too. so much because I feel like a dick because like, yeah. I no, was, I, but I, I did it too. I did it too. And then I watched videos of Fugazi and they've got no pedals. And I was like, oh, but they sound better than everybody else. Like what's happening here? So yeah, they had the old Marshland 100 heads and like an SG and that's it, the end. But one of the things I love about Orange is the, is the, the, the paucity of controls the low number of controls. It's like, you know, they have like gain, volume, bass, treble. I'm like, that's how many controls a fucking amp should have. Yeah. I don't want more controls than that. Do you know what I mean? Just like, meh, meh, meh. Well, this is, I, should, I should add, if I hadn't added this enough already, that I'm not that technically minded about gear. Like I don't get into like uh, frequency response graphs and, and circuit diagrams and that kind of shit. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's, that's above my level of understanding. Um, but I mean, again, there's something really intuitive to me about some amps. I mean, I, you know, like say for Marshalls, I'm kind of keener on the kind of the, the older, simpler stuff. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, but you just being able to just crank and and feel it out. Do you know what I mean? I don't feel like amp settings are something I ever want to be subtle with. Particularly, it's right. just like you plug guitar into it, you fucking ring it out, and then you go, "Hmm, let's try turning the middle up to 10. Do you know what I mean? See what happens. And then you go, "Oh yeah, that sounds fucking great." Do you know what I mean? And it's like it, that whole safe cracker thing's not really my vibe. Do you know what I mean? Um, Mine neither, and I run a YouTube channel based on gear. Right, but it's but it's it's. it's, it's I like like, that sounds good. Leave it alone. Move on. Totally. But also max it to see what happens. Yeah, it's max it to see what happens. Also remember that the whole point thing you're trying to capture is performance, not technicality. Yeah. Um, I do. I, I mean, if we're going, so yeah, we probably have an orange rig. Um, you know, I probably treat myself to a, to a rat. I reckon for a pedal, I do like the rats. A pretty kind of workhorse distortion. You know, big muffs have their place, but they also have their not places. Yeah. Um, Rat's pretty kind of Swiss army knife for me. Um, but I mean, to be honest, like live, I basically, I, I have a boost pedal and that's it. I have one sound and then I have, make it a bit louder for a solo. So what's going on on your camper? Just to find out what's, oh, what well, is your so, camper? So I have, on? so uh, that is a fine question that I can't actually remember the answer to now. I think it might be based on like a kind of, like a, 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 a twin kind of vibe or something like that. I'm not 100% sure though, because essentially to a large degree, I let my front of the house sound guy program it for me because it's like he's, he has the holistic vision. This is another thing. The point that if you're playing in a band, who gives a fuck about your tone on its own? It doesn't no. matter. It matters how it fits with everybody else, right? So he did a lot of tweaking on that for me. But um, I have four, four patches on my pedal board. I have number one is clean, so which I use very rarely. But if I need to play some clean electric, that's over there. Number two is my absolutely go-to rhythm distorted electric guitar. It sounds great. It's got a raw, especially with that P92 in it, it's like, ah. Um, number three is the same sound with a boost on it for solo. And number four is my comedy funk wah flange sound, which I only ever play to annoy everybody in my band and sound guy. Are you um, going to do that tonight? No, I don't generally do it during the show. I just do it in sound checks. Everyone's like, play a new song and go, wah, 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 and play fucking Grey Chill theme tune or whatever. And everyone's like, oh God, he's fucking doing it again. Um, and that's me. So it's very simplistic. I mean, it's part, a lot of this is like, when I got into playing electric, I had to learn how to do pedal changes whilst playing. I'd never really it's done thing, it before. Right? Yeah. It's a thing. First it's few shows electric, doing. I was like, uh, what the fuck? Like falling over and all the rest. But I, I, most, I, at least half the time I play acoustic live. Sure. So, you know, I played Martin D18s because they don't break. And I have broken so many acoustics. And that's what Kurt Cobain played, right? Uh, I don't the, know. The unplugged. Uh, quite possibly. I don't know. That would, would be, be that would be cool. I believe um, you had a D18. Lovely. Yeah. Um, gear nerds. Uh, fact check him. Um, the, we, the, I've closed the channel now. I, I, I have a collection of guitars at home that uh, don't come on tour for right. reasons that are about to become apparent. I, my dream absolute number one dream guitar that I own is my Gibson 1957 Country and Western, which is in 100% pristine condition and is a lovely, lovely, lovely guitar. I've also got, uh, got a 19, uh, I think it's like 1940 Martin, which is mahogany, which is very, it's like a parlor, it's really small, it's a fucking cool guitar. I've also, probably my most fancy guitar, I have a D'Angelico 1942 arch top, which is a good, lovely guitar in and of itself, but also used to be Loudon Wainwright's songwriting guitar, no and way. is now my songwriting guitar. Um, and Loudon Wainwright's one of my favorite songwriters, right. so that's cool. Um, but you know, these I, I did used to play Gibson Hummingbirds live, which I love. I love a hummingbird, yeah. but I broke them, and they're really? not cheap to fix because we play a punk rock show, and I jump around, so and you... I, I hammer the sides of my guitar, and right. I do kicks and stuff. 
And it was like I was bankrupting myself, breaking Gibson Hummingbirds. And uh, my friend Chuck Reagan, who is here today with Hot Water Music, but uh, he does solo stuff as well, and he plays the D18s, and he w I was kind of sobbing on his shoulder about how much money I was spending on fixing guitars. And he was like, oh, dude, play Martin D18s. You can't, he was like, you can't break them. I have broken one. Right. Se several strong statements in this video. I, I love I, it. I've broken one D18. Wow. Yeah, by throwing it on the floor <laughs> when I was in a very bad mood, and I'm quite ashamed. Um, uh, and... Uh, my uh, my crew were just like, oh, for God's sake. Um, and it did then get fixed, thankfully, by the luthier that we work with. Oh, good. Well, I hope you don't break any tonight. No, no. I well, I actually, no. <clears throat> let me take that back. I hope you kind of do, because I think that's cool. I don't know, man. That was a, that was I, there was a there was a bunch of shit going wrong in that show. And there were some people in the crowd who were pissing me off and all the rest, as in they were being uncool with each other sort of thing. Right. And I was like, ah, and then immediately felt, I'm really not in the whole kind of throw TVs out of the window kind of school of thought, it's bullshit. Um, uh, but I threw a guitar on the floor and then went, oh, why did I do that? And uh, my guitar tech just laughed at me as I walked off stage. <laughs> it was like, you silly prick. Um, which took the sting out of the situation. Good. Let's say that. Anyway, none of that tonight. We'll just have no, a good rock and roll a show. Good show, good songs, good people. We've been out in the crowd already. They seem like lovely people. Awesome. Help for a good time. Definitely. The sun is shining. Hope it stays that way. Yeah. And, well, um, it'll go down, hopefully, at some point. Roughly that's around a good point, yeah. yeah. Let's hope it does go down. And yeah. comes back up again. Yeah. <laughs> Sometime tomorrow, roughly. This has got extremely philosophical. It has. <laughs> All right. Thank yes. you for your time. My pleasure, it's man. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Uh, we got don't into don't some break shit. those SGs. Yeah. yeah we'll we'll fill you in with the Kemper settings at some point. I know that's what you want. So I'm just pushing Jens because I can see his arms shaking yeah, yeah, yeah. and I feel really oh, sorry for him. And I wasn't going to mention it, but now I am. <laughs> Thank you, Jens. Thanks for watching this video. And if you want to check out Frank's stuff, you should. There's links and things somewhere near this screen, down there probably. See you later. Cheers. Bye-bye.